throwing entire families out of their homes and all without due process. No, we're not talking about a totalitarian state. It's happening here in America. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel and this is Nightline. If you come into Philadelphia to buy your drugs, we're gonna confiscate your car if we catch you. We're seeing people suggesting uh, the adoption of sort of hysterical measures that really do not address the problem. How far is too far in fighting the war on drugs? And will these extreme actions make any difference? That's our story tonight. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. Only yesterday, Washington's mayor, Marion Barry, who has made it clear that he doesn't think much of the measure, signed into law a curfew that goes into effect on Monday. Youngsters under the age of 18 will not be allowed out on the streets of Washington between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. on weekdays, midnight to 6 a.m. on weekends. Should they be on the streets during those hours, police can detain them overnight, and the youngsters' parents will have to pay a fine. The new law is likely to put an enormous burden on the already overburdened D.C. police. It will probably be enforced far more in black neighborhoods than white. And since drug dealing teenagers frequently come from homes where there is only one parent who can ill afford to pay the fine, the law may aggravate what is already a strained situation. But as Bonnie Strauss reports, society is so desperate to show that it's fighting back against drug dealers that passing a flawed piece of legislation is regarded as preferable to doing nothing. There are few clear areas in which we as a society must rise up united and express our intolerance. And the most obvious now is... My office is already conducting an exhaustive review of our national fight against... But I'm also appalled by what's happening to our city and our region. And I'm outraged at the amount of drugs. 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 What can be done? That's the question facing policymakers around the country as drug use and violence continues to escalate. Some of the answers may be sensible. Some have long-range goals. But most come in the form of quick fixes for desperate times. There were two in New Jersey, judges are revoking the driver's licenses of those convicted of drug offenses, even if a car was not involved in the crime. Last year, over 9,000 licenses were revoked. And licenses aren't the only things being seized. If you come into Philadelphia to buy your drugs, we're going to confiscate your car if we catch you. In Philadelphia and across the country, Police are increasing their use of federal forfeiture laws to confiscate the property of alleged drug dealers, even before conviction. Instead of addressing this in a systematic way and dealing with causes, we're seeing people suggesting uh, the adoption of sort of hysterical measures that really do not address the problem. In Washington, D.C., the drug crisis has become so overwhelming that last week, in an unprecedented move, the federal government stepped in. The need and the means exist for significant federal emergency assistance to the people of this city and this region. Bennett's proposals called for two new D.C. prisons, 57 special agents, faster prosecutions with stiffer penalties, and three outpatient clinics. The original price tag, $70 million, with less than $4 million targeted for treatment and education. Within a week of the announcement, plans for one D.C. prison were already scrapped. The facility will now be located in rural Maryland and not reserved for D.C. prisoners. Law enforcement and punishment are no solutions to the long-term problem of drug use, particularly with the inner city. But it's the law and order proposals that are shaking up communities, grabbing headlines, and stirring civil rights concerns. Everyone wants to solve the drug problem, but how to accomplish that is another matter. D.C. Mayor Marion Barry yesterday signed a curfew law. When it goes into effect, kids under 18 will not be allowed on the streets after 11 p.m. on weeknights, midnight on weekends. Even though many curfew laws across the country have been defeated in the courts, supporters here are steadfast. That a police officer would, would inform them that they were violating the curfew and that they should move on and give them a reasonable amount of time to get going. Uh, if they did not do that, they would be arrested. 
Police say it would turn their already overworked force into babysitters. Others question the law's fairness. Um, we think a curfew law that in effect puts tens of thousands of, of law-abiding young people under house arrest every night because a handful of young people are out on the streets dealing drugs, uh, we think is also beyond the bounds. I feel as though it's going to be a lot of discrimination too. I think, you know, a lot of white cops will bother the black kids in, in the black neighborhoods. Also signed yesterday, an anti-loitering bill. Its target, drug zones. But even some who voted for the measure, like council member John Wilson, expressed concern, remembering when he was harassed as a youth. The policeman told me to move on, and I just turned around and looked at him and said, uh, for what? I'm just looking in the window. And, and in, I guess in less than two minutes, I was on the ground with somebody standing in my chest. These days, community responses to drug problems can have national repercussions. Take Alexandria, Virginia, a Washington suburb. An incident that took place here on the night of March 22nd may have changed the character of public housing in America. Public housing projects are fertile ground for drug abuse and crime. So it was drugs and public housing that became the focus after a tense standoff between a convicted felon and police near a well-known crack house. <laughs> The gunman was killed, but not before fatally wounding a 13-year veteran of the police force. The result? Mayor Jim Moran asked the government to speed up the eviction process in public housing. He got it, and something more. The authority to evict entire families based on the alleged drug activity of one family member, even before conviction. They are not drawing distinctions. They're going in there waving a club and saying, we're going to evict everybody in this unit regardless whether everybody in the unit is innocent. The government can't take on the role of, of parenting. If a, if a parent uh, loses their right to, to live in public housing, the children unfortunately lose that right too. The Secretary of Housing and Urban Development granted the same right to Massachusetts on Friday and said he's received hundreds of inquiries. I will personally at HUD waive the lease and grievance rules for those public housing uh, authorities uh, to evict those who are involved in drug trafficking or use or related uh, criminal activities. Another HUD recommendation endorsed by Kemp, ID cards for public housing residents, modeled on a program already in place in Chicago. It's a touchy issue. I feel as though that when we go take our pictures for our driver's license or some sort of ID, school ID, why should we need another dog tag? When I hear people talk about putting IDs in, on, on residents of, of this city and this country, I think about South Africa with the past laws. Penalties, tougher enforcement, restrictions. The question being asked, will any of this make a difference? I'm concerned that once the law enforcement uh, impulse among Americans has been satisfied. There is no other impulse left over for the long-term solution. Stay down. I got the red one. They're gradual. They're frustrating. Everybody wants something to say about it. Sir, you're in the red room. We ask you the question, but understand what you're right, sir. And somebody want to come up with a solution? You have ID with you? And nobody's really digging to the root of the thing. This is Bonnie Strauss for Nightline in Washington. Later, we'll talk about the tough anti-drug proposals with a community leader in a public housing project in Philadelphia. But first, when we come back, we'll be joined by two people on opposite sides of the issue. Florida Congressman Clay Shaw, chairman of the Republican Task Force on Drugs, and John Powell, national legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union. This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by AT&T. You know how I always want... Your kids, they're not the trouble people think. New parents tell how their families are working. Attorney John Powell, who's with us now in our New York studios, is legal director of the American Civil Liberties Union. The ACLU has been concerned about the due process issues raised by steps being taken to deal with drug crimes. Congressman Clay Shaw of Florida is the Republican Congressional Task Force. He is the chairman of that task force, which was formed to assist federal drug czar William Bennett in working out a legislative package to help fight the war on drugs. Congressman Shaw, 
is in our Washington bureau. Any of those laws, Congressman Shaw, that, uh, that you've seen, any of that legislation that you feel is maybe a little bit too much too soon, not carefully well, thought through? Well, looking at, uh, looking at the uh, lead-in that uh, we just saw coming into the show, I think it certainly, uh, certainly illustrates that you're going to have to have some restraint and judgment on the part of law enforcement in enforcing some of these laws. The uh, loitering is, uh, is, is an area which uh, uh, has a great deal of uh, case law holding it unconstitutional, and the, uh, uh, the curfew laws are going to be tough for the Washington police to enforce if they try to come along with strict enforcement. If they simply use it as a tool and use it reasonably to assist them in uh, just trying to put the people off the streets or being able to stop them to find out exactly uh, what they're up to, uh, it, it could work, but uh, it is going to, uh, it's going to get a tough legal challenge, and uh, I believe that uh, we're going to have to wait and see how that comes out. Mr. Powell, I would assume that you and your colleagues are going to be among, uh, among the challengers. Uh, would that be accurate? Yes, that will be accurate. Uh, there are a number of concerns with a number of the measures that are being considered and that are being uh, pursued right now. And one, one big area is that the whole process really um, deals with the drug problem only as a law enforcement problem. And it's clearly not simply a law enforcement problem. And the law enforcement efforts have, um, up until this point, been ineffective. And I think that even what's being considered, even in this, its draconian state, will continue to be ineffective. Among the various laws that we, uh, that we saw in the past few minutes that Bonnie Strauss referred to, for example, the loitering, the, uh, <clears throat> the curfew law, the business about the ID cards, uh, pick any one of them that you like, uh, people being thrown out of public housing because a member of the family was dealing drugs, uh, any one of them that you think is going to survive? Well. It's hard to say. I think all of them are uh, offensive and for various reasons. I mean, take the public housing uh, law that's being considered. Uh, first of all, they're saying that not someone who's been convicted of drugs, and if someone's been convicted of selling drugs or even using drugs, there's already a remedy. Lock them up. Uh, if, you know, there are legal sanctions for someone that's found guilty of losing drug or using drugs. What they're saying is that if someone has allegedly been using drugs, they can kick that person out and the entire family. What if it's a 10-year-old girl living in a house, uh, household with several members, several siblings, and a parent? The solution, even if she has used drugs, marijuana, what have you, doesn't seem to be to make that family homeless. And to kick someone out of public housing, run the risk of immediately making that family homeless. Congressman Shaw, let me ask you to respond to that, but before you do, let me emphasize one of the points that uh, Mr. Powell made, and that is that the mere allegation is sufficient. Doesn't that go contrary to everything that, that is most sacred to us in American law? Well, I'm not sure that that's, uh, I'm not sure that's correct as far as a mere allegation. Uh, what we have seen, and this happened in the 1988 uh, omnibus drug bill, we put in a provision that anyone who was dealing in drugs within the uh, public housing unit would be, uh, would be expelled. Now, this is taking it one step further, and it's, it's saying that the people that are involved in uh, the use of drugs or the dealing of drugs are not going to be subject to uh, public housing. We have to remember that for public housing, this is federally assisted housing. We have waiting lists of people waiting to get in. It's not like we're going to do away with that housing unit. We're simply going to recognize the fact that people living in there are going to be held to a certain standard. What, we are, these... what we are saying, though, Congressman, is that, is that we are not only judging someone guilty by association, but we're also going to punish them simply for their association, even if there's no indication that they were involved in, in the commission of a crime themselves. Well, the, the fact that they are part of a family unit that, uh, that is, there will be people that suffer. But we have to remember what we're trying to do is to get hold of a very desperate situation. Uh, we saw what happened in Alexandria. This is not isolated to one city or one housing unit. It's all across the country. And we have to start talking about what about the other people who are living in public housing. You know what happened in Alexandria? You want to know the background of that story? The man who shot the cop in Alexandria had been in a housing unit in D.C., and the folks in D.C. had called for the police to come on a number of occasions, and the police never came and never did anything. That's why that man lived to go across to Alexandria and kill a cop.
Yes, but that's that shows the violence that's involved in this, uh, in no, this whole situation. No question about the violence. My question is, you know, you got plenty of laws on the books already. If those laws, you know, if there were enough police and if there was uh, the, the ability on the part of the police to, uh, to, to act out or act in response to every complaint, you wouldn't have to be creating new laws. But I think when you look at the problem that we have right here in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, you could double the police force and still would not have adequate police protection to stop the killing and the violence that's going on right here in the nation's capital. We, okay. have, to, we have to legislate responsible conduct and recognize that people can lose certain privileges that they have by not acting in a responsible way. Mr. Powell, hang in for just a moment. We'll come back to you. And when we come back, we'll also be talking with one of the people most directly affected by the tough anti-drug measures now under discussion, Virginia Wilkes, the mother of two teenagers and a community leader herself in a public housing project in Philadelphia. Ford profiles in quality, reliability, the quality of today's Ford. Each year, six Virginia Wilkes, who's with us now in our Philadelphia Bureau, is president of the Residence Council of the Richard Allen Public Housing Project in Philadelphia, where Housing and Urban Development Secretary Jack Kemp announced the administration's proposals for dealing with drug dealers in public housing last February. Ms. Wilkes is the mother of two boys aged 17 and 18. We have to keep our eye on the ball, Ms. Wilkes, and that is the, the object of all of these laws is to make life a little bit safer, a little bit more comfortable for people who are not dealing drugs, using drugs, uh, and involved in any way with drugs. Do you find any of these laws helpful? Um, I find some of them are, but a lot of them need a, lot of, some, a, a whole lot of work. Um, especially the part about the identification of all the PHA residents. That would be somewhat hard in a conventional site. When I say conventional, I mean a low-rise development like Richard Allen is. Now, if you're talking about um, providing ID for those in high-rise buildings or senior buildings, then that can be done. But to do that in, in a low-rise development, it's, it's going to be real hard to do. Because? Explain that to me. Because it's, um, there is, you don't have, the Housing Authority doesn't have control of our, I can only speak about my development anyway, okay? You'd have to have almost like a wall around it, you mean, Thank and, you. And, and one entrance. Thank you. Yeah. And there's uh, many uh, ingress and egress in uh, Richard Allen. So therefore, to give, to make everybody have to have ID, I can't see how they're going to do it. What about the idea of if, if one person in a family is selling drugs, let's say even using one of the rooms in the house as a crack kitchen? Uh -huh. uh, the way it looks right now, folks, every member of the family could be thrown out. I don't agree with that. It, it would put a lot of pressure on the family to say, get that, you know, get that drug dealing out of here, wouldn't it? Yeah, it, it would not, um, what I'm saying, I don't agree with that to the extent, how can you penalize a family for what one family member has done? Now, nobody has full control over their children once, you know, they leave their home at any time of the day. The child can make, leave out and say they're going to school, okay? If that child can go to school and just maybe stay in school a couple of hours, if there's not any, you know, communications being done with the, with the family along the school, who knows where that child is for those, the rest of the hours of the day when he's not around the mother. So to try to penalize the family for what this child is doing is un totally unfair. Let me, let me ask you one more question, then we'll go back to a couple of our other guests also. I, I know you live in Philadelphia, not here in Washington, D.C., yes. but let's say for the sake of argument that there was a curfew. Uh, that uh, you've got one 17-year-old, that your 17-year-old had to be in by 11 o'clock on, on weekdays. You for it? Against yes, it? I would be for, I would be for that. Because there is a lot of young, you know, t uh, teenage kids hanging out on these corners 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And they should be in the house. I mean, it takes, if it takes a curfew to make um, these parents responsible for their children in that manner, then I'm all for that. All right. Now, Mr. Powell, you wanted to respond to something that the congressman had said in our last segment. Yes. He, uh, congressman Shaw suggested that there's a need to be responsible, and, and, and I couldn't agree more. Unfortunately, that most of the uh, measures that are being considered and that are coming out of Congress are irresponsible, they're uh, unconstitutional, uh, they're immoral, and they're ineffective. There's no focus on treatment. All of the focus is on punishment. Uh, and everyone, including law enforcement officials, prosecutors, uh, police chiefs, are saying that it's not simply a law enforcement problem, and even doubling the police force will not solve the problem.
Is part of the is part of the problem, Congressman, that we have become kind of a short-term goal-oriented society, and and to say, look, what you got to do first of all is you got to educate these kids. What you got to do is provide them job training. What you got to do, I mean, those are long-term goals. Take well, two, think, three, four, uh, five years. Well, I think we are we are in the Congress frustrated, and we're looking for instant gratification. Uh, but when, what Mr. Powell, the way he characterized the legislation coming out of the Congress, uh, is, is simply not the way that legislation came out. There's a lot of treatment in there. There's a provision in there that provides for treatment of, uh, of pregnant women, something that we haven't had before. Uh, there's a lot of educational proje projects in there. There's some uh, uh, assistance to uh, local government. It's out all of up every, and down the line. It's out of, I'm, I'm sorry to keep butting in like this, but we've got a very short segment. Out of every hundred dollars being spent, how many do you think are being spent on treatment and education, and how many are being spent on, on law enforcement type solutions? Well, uh, less than five percent is being spent on treatment, and that was cut back in the last eight years. During all the hysteria around drugs, treatment and prevention has been cut back. The only effective uh, drug education program in the country, and that has worked, is the drug education program against tobacco, which right. is a very serious drug with very serious addiction. We have got to take a break. Congressman, I'll give you and Ms. Wilkes a chance to have the final word when we continue, which we'll do in just a moment. Keep muscle while you lose fat. And Special K has the highest level of dietary protein available in a cereal. So exercise your good judgment, too. Include this Special K breakfast in your balanced diet. And make a firm commitment to your body. Special K. Keep the muscle. Lose the fat. It's the creamiest, the dreamiest. The front line, as it were, if it were up to you and someone said, here's the money, how much do you want to go for education and treatment? How much do you want to go for protection? How would you allocate it? What I would, what I would, I would allocate it for both. Okay. But I'd like to say this, Ted. Has anybody ever taken the time to sit down and think how did public housing become the way it is at this point? It didn't just, you know, it didn't just get like this overnight. These things have been going on, but now it's more escalated than it was before, ever been before. Um, Pete, the uh, housing authority does not have any strong leasing standards whatsoever. They will lease to anybody. They supposed to screen these tenants that come in. They're discreet. I mean, screen them for what? The uh, resident council doesn't have any input as to what goes on. Okay. Um, I've, I've got to cut you off because we've only got about 25 seconds left, and okay. I wanted the congressman to have a chance just to respond. Truly, only five percent is think, going for treatment. I mean, let me just ask the congressman because okay. well, when you're looking, seconds. when you're looking at the federal budget, you're looking at everything from interdiction to uh, eradication in foreign countries to law enforcement to prosecution, all up and down the line, and building prisons. But I think one thing is important, and I want to be sure I clear one point up. Uh, Secretary Kemp has not been talking about evicting people just helter-skelter and throwing them out without any due process of law. And he has not talked about doing it just because one of the youngsters might have gotten into some drug problems at school. There's good judgment that has to be used, compassion has to be used, but we must remember the people living in public housing deserved a decent place to live, all right. and we must help them. I thank all of you very much. We'll be doing a program next Thursday night that'll be a very long program. We'll be covering a lot of these subjects in depth. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Copeland, Washington, for all of us here at ABC News. Good night. <laughs>